Is this the beginning of the end? Is this the beginning of the end? It was the beginning of July 1995, and as we like to say in our family, my wife was nigh unto birth. She was at the very end of her pregnancy with our second son, Kenan, and uh, she had been on bed rest for three months. Three months. Kenan just wanted to come out early, get into the life, and get it going here, but but Laura, being on bed rest, waited in anticipation for this day. And so bags were packed, and as we moved towards the due date, all of a sudden, Laura poked me and said, it's time to go. We got to get to the hospital. And so we ran out. If you're a parent here today, if you're a dad, you don't know the pain. I don't know the pain. I've never given birth to a baby. It's impossible. I'm a male. Someone said amen. I can't have babies. But my wife was nigh into birth. She said it was time to go. We packed the car. We headed to the hospital in Bellevue, Washington. And there the wait began. We waited, and we waited, and we waited some more, and we waited some more, and we waited some more. We kept waiting in anticipation for Keenan to come. I had a very good friend at that time. His name was Randy Mann. Randy Mann was a domino man, and he was my domino buddy. As a matter of fact, we played domino so much we had a book. And we kept score. And I, I am proud to say that I am the domino champion of Kirkland, Washington of 1995. But he was my domino buddy. And so he came and joined me at the hospital. And we waited and we waited. And we were getting kind of bored. And so we began to walk around the maternity ward. And as we were walking around the maternity room, if you've been in that place, you know that they have a little kitchen there for, for moms, for waiting moms. And inside of that kitchen, they could have popsicles to sandwiches to all kinds of little things that the mom might want. And, and Randy and I began to poke our head inside the refrigerator and found that there were some tasty popsicles. And so we began to eat popsicles. And, and then we couldn't take it any longer because the waiting was going on so long, we broke out our domino board. And we began to pl play dominoes late into the night. Finally, this nurse came in, and she said, you guys are having too much fun. It's time for you to leave. She kicked all of us out of the hospital that night. And I remember thinking, the nerve of her, the nerve of her. My wife is getting ready to have a baby, and we're having too much fun. Childbirth. Today, we're going to talk about the beginning of birth pains, We've, over last week, we talked about Israel and its place in prophetic scriptures and the return of Christ. And today, I'm going to talk about this thought, this idea of the blessed hope, the blessed hope, the return of Jesus. What do we do while we are waiting? What do we do while we are waiting? If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. Last week we talked about Israel's role in biblical prophecy. Today we're looking to look, we're going to look at this preparing ourselves for the beginning of the end. Next week I'm going to talk to you about why so much hatred towards the Jews and how then shall we live? How then shall we live? If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. We're going to read several verses here. I want you to stand with me in the honor of reading God's word. Matthew chapter 24, this is known as the Olivet Discourse. This is Jesus' prophetic teaching about the end of times. The disciples were very curious. Even in the disciples' day 2,000 years ago, there was a sense for the Jewish people that the Messiah was going to come and he was going to restore natural Israel to the right, to the right and righteous place as God's chosen people, the head and not the tail. That was not the situation. At this time, Jerusalem was controlled by the Romans. The, the J Jewish people, the Israeli pe people were subject to the Romans. And there was a sense among them that the Messiah was going to come at any moment. The Messiah was going to come at any moment. And they are leaving the temple. Now hear me today. Jesus was Jewish. He was a good Jew. When the temple was still in Jerusalem standing, Jesus when he was in Jerusalem, would go to the temple every single day. As a matter of fact, good Jews would go to the temple three times a day. We see in the book of Acts where the disciples made their way to the temple for the third time on that day. 
And so Jesus, being a good Jew, is leaving the temple, and there's some discussion among the disciples, among the apostles, about the end of time. So we're going to be, pick this up in verse number 3 here. And the Bible says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. Everyone say, say, sign of your coming. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered them and said, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, or I am the Christos, the anointed one. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation, the word nation here is ethnos. It literally means ethnic group against ethnic group. Nation will rise against nation. And kingdom, political kingdoms against political kingdoms. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these are but the beginning of birth pains. Everyone say birth pains. All these are the beginning of uh, birth pains. I want to talk to you on this idea today. Don't be led astray or the return of Jesus is our blessed hope. Everyone say blessed hope. Blessed. You saw a little video just a moment ago about Operation Blessing, and we've done this every year for many, many years, but we give away hundreds and hundreds of food bags to families in our community. It's an opportunity for your family. I love that little video there with the kid walking with his parents and filling up the bag. Folks, if you've got young kids in your home, it's a great opportunity for you to teach them that we are blessed people and have a grateful and thankful heart. You can fill up a bag. You can also just give if you want to give. You don't have time to purchase. You can just give towards Operation Blessing. But we've already given away, I believe, hundreds of bags. And so the school and the church are in competition. So church, let's just see if we can beat City Church Academy today. Amen. But I want us to pray today. We are going to pray. Jesus, the Bible commands us, the psalmist commands us in Psalms 1 and 22, verse number, 20, uh, verse number 6, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Today we're going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Will you join with me as we pray today? Father, thank you, Lord, that in this moment and this opportunity, there's a great sense around the globe today. There are protests taking place. There's anxiety and tension about the war that's happening in the Middle East and that it would expand and grow and spill over into a bigger war. And God, we know that all these things are birth pains. These are all signs that, Jesus, you are going to come again. But I thank you today for every person that's here. I pray, Lord, that as people of faith, we don't have to live in fear of the future that's going to take place. But we can live with faith and confidence and knowing that you are with us today. I thank you, Lord, for this service. I thank you for those that are here, that you would give them a spiritual ear to hear. We need you, Holy Spirit, to open our ears and open our eyes to see the signs of the times that are before us. We love you, Jesus. With a great sense of anticipation today, we receive your return as our blessed hope. I ask this now in Jesus' wonderful and powerful name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Understanding what's happening in the day that you and I live. War broke out on October 7th in the Middle East. Israel was attacked by a radical Islamic group called Hamas. And over the coming days, as videos came out of this barbaric attack, the world witnessed, the world witnessed something that they couldn't believe would ever happen again. In World War II, there was an empire called the Nazis. They were led by a man by the name of Hitler. And in that period, from the late 1930s to the mid-1940s, he would execute, slaughter, and barbarically murder over 6 million Jews. The cry from the world that day, when the war was finally completed and the Allied forces had taken dominion over Nazism in Europe and over the Japanese Imperial Army in the East, that day... That cry from the world the United Nations was, never again. Never again. And for the last 70 years, we've lived basically with that thought. We would never see the rise of anti-Semiticism. We would never see the rise of the hatred of Jews calling for the destruction of the people of Israel like we did in that day. But folks, sad to say, we are living in a day 
Hundreds of thousands of people have gathered across major cities around the globe today crying for the destruction, for the annihilation of Israel. There's a slogan last night. Tens of thousands of people gathered in Washington, D.C. I saw some of the reports. I watched a few moments of it. And there's a slogan that they chant as they march to the, through the streets from the river, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, Palestine will be free. Hamas in its charter, you can read it for yourself. It was written in 1988. They have 36 points to their charter, and they call for the annihilation and the destruction of the Jewish, not only the Jewish state, but the Jewish people. We're watching in front of our very eyes things unfold that we thought would never take place in our lifetime, at least not in my lifetime. When war broke out on October 7th, we saw the horrific images that took place there uh, along the Gaza Strip area, along the border where Hamas flew in through paratroopers and marched in and snuck in and assassinated uh, over 1,400 people. To where we are today, we're watching in real time. If you're on Twitter, you can see images of people being bombed and killed in the Gaza Strip. It's heartbreaking. It's destruction. It's death. God is not a God of death. God is a God of life. God hates war. Innocent people are collateral damage. They call it collateral damage. I call it the destruction of God's very own creation, people made in his image. It breaks the heart of God. But why Israel? Why the Jewish people? Why is this war in the Middle East literally pushing everything else off the news cycle today and becoming the central focus of humanity? I mean, there's only 8 million people living in Israel. Only 8 million people. Last week I showed you the map of the surrounding 1 billion people, the Muslim people that surround Israel. Israel, small little country, you can barely see it on a map when you put the whole map up there. They're just a small little group. Why is all the geopolitical conflict and tension of the world in this very moment centered around these people? You see, there is a thing in Scripture and people who study the Bible called prophecy. Everyone say prophecy. Prophecy in the Old Testament was about the coming of the Messiah in his first first birth. We see it in the book of Genesis. From the very beginning, God promised that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. We see all throughout the Old Testament the promise of of Jesus' first coming. But we also see a promise of his second coming, a ruling and reigning Messiah. As a matter of fact, regarding the return of Christ and the second coming of Jesus. Over 150 chapters of the Bible are dedicated to Jesus and his soon return. You'll see a theme. You'll see a theme reoccurring in scriptures. And this theme is the sense that Jesus could return at any moment. Theologians call this term imminent, the imminent return of Christ or the soon coming return of Jesus. All throughout scriptures, you see this over and over, especially in the New Testament. I mean, even in the time of the apostles, when they're standing with Jesus, and we just read it in Matthew 24, when are, when are the signs of your coming when you're going to come again? Paul the apostle writes to the church at Corinth. He says these words, Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You don't lack. You can put that. Did you put the phrase up, the imminent return? Are you following along here? There you go. We're just going to back up. I'll just catch up with the slides. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Imminent simply means likely to happen at at any moment. The imminent return of Christ could happen at any moment. You see this theme over and over throughout the New Testament writings. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Put the scripture up for me. As we eagerly await the return of Christ. Eagerly await the return of Christ. You see, the scripture commands us not to be ignorant about the times. Not to be ignorant about his coming. Paul the apostle said, brethren and sisters, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep until the coming of the Lord. I don't want you to be ignorant about his return. See, prophecies of the Old Testament are not under, or under, uh, and the New Testament are not open to private interpretation. This is so important today. 
This is so important because many people today, they read the prophetic scriptures and they try to tie today's headlines to events that have taken place or spoken of in the Bible. We must be very, very, very careful of thinking we have some private interpretation. In 1841, there was a group, there was a woman, and her name was Sister Miller. And Sister Miller had a belief that Christ was going to return at any moment. She actually set a date. In 1841, she said a day that Christ would return on such and such day. And that obviously didn't happen because we're almost 200 years past 1841. You see, the prophecies about Christ's return are not open to private interpretation. But there is a promised blessing to all of us who read. The book of Revelation says, blessed is the one who reads the words of these promises. When we study about the return of Christ, when we prepare our hearts for the return of Christ, there is a special blessing. You know what that blessing is? That blessing is that we are living with a greater sense of understanding that this life is not our home. This world is not our home. Politics are not the final solution. Come on. We are part of another kingdom today, the kingdom of God. And Jesus is coming again. Paul the Apostle said, we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of, our glory, uh, appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we, await, as we await his appearing today, as we await the revelation, the revelation, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ today, we must not set dates. I've mentioned before also uh, about the time of 1841, but that wasn't the last time, and it wasn't the first time. You can read all throughout church history. I became a Christian in the, in the late, uh, late November of 1983. And soon after that, I served in my first youth camp in Prescott, Arizona. And I remember I was sitting there around a group of leaders, and there was a pastor in the group, and he began to tell me that he believed that Jesus was going to return on a certain day. I mean, he believed that Jesus was going to return on a certain day. And he convinced the people in his church to sell their properties. And they all moved in together waiting for Jesus to return. Wow. Jesus warned us not to do that. Matthew chapter 25, verse number 13. Look at the scripture here. Look what Jesus says. Therefore, keep watch. Watch. Look out. Watch the signs. Look for things that are taking place. But listen, no one knows the day nor the hour for a person to set a date. All throughout human history, all throughout Christian history, people that have set dates about the return of Christ, they've missed it every single time. And what happens when people set dates? And people are going to set dates. Right now, what's taking place in Israel, this war potentially could spread out even farther and and cause greater conflict among the world's nations and the cry for ceasefire and those kinds of things that are happening right now because the world knows that this could spill over. This could spill over into another world war. And listen, folks, we do not want world war. We do not want world war. Come on, we do not want any war. But Jesus told us to watch. Watch for what? Watch for what? Watch for signs of his coming. In Matthew chapter 24, with the opening passage that I read today, has two other parallel passages in the New Testament. And Mark's gospel, chapter 13, also records the words of Jesus on Mount of Olives with his disciples, as well as Luke chapter 21. You see, prophetic scriptures are twofold. Prophetic scriptures are written for the people that they were spoken to of in that day, but they also have a not yet. They have an already, but they have a things that are to come. You see, when Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 talked to the disciples about his return and his coming, he told them first this one thing would happen, that the destruction of Jerusalem would take place. In Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2, Jesus said, you will, you will see these things. Truly I say to you, there will not be one stone left upon another. They will all be thrown down. You can go to Jerusalem today. You can go to Jerusalem today and you can see one standing foundation wall. Because in A.D. 7, the Romans marched through all the way up Megiddo Valley from the north from Lebanon. They marched all the way up Megiddo Valley, destroying everything in its path all the way into Jerusalem. Literally killing and annihilating and tearing down the very temple that Jesus was standing in when he was talking to his disciples. That's already taken place. 
But the prophetic promise was that Israel one day would be restored as a people. I talked about this last week. You can go back and, and watch the video where I give you specific verses. But specifically in Ezekiel chapter 28, God says that he would gather the Israelites from all the peoples of the nations that they had been scattered. God would gather them together to their very own land. You see, but there are things that are still to come. And look what Jesus says here in Matthew 24, verse number 3. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, and they said, tell us, when will this happen? When will the destruction of Jerusalem take place? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? What will be the sign of the end of the age? What are the birth pains? What are the birth pains that are going to take place before you return? Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, this great discourse that Jesus gives to his disciples has been studied for 2,000 years. Volumes, countless books have been written on these two chapters of scriptures. But 22 times Jesus gives prophetic signs, birth pain signs that are going to come into the future. I asked my wife, I said, what does it feel like to be pregnant? What does it feel like to be pregnant? She said, she, she, said, you know, she, she said, you know what? She said, no one told me how horrible and painful it was going to be. She said, but the moment they put that baby into your arms, you say, I'll do it again. I'll do it again. There were great birth pains. There are going to be terrible moments before Jesus comes. As a matter of fact, I've broken these birth pains into four areas. I call them FOLD. Everyone say FOLD. F-O-L-D. FOLD. You can write this acronym down. Number one, the first thing that's going to happen is there's going to be great fear on the earth. There's going to be great fear on the earth. I didn't really understand this until March of 2020. In March of 2020, something happened, not only in America, but around the globe that sparked fear like I have never seen it. We were sitting at Applebee's right over here in the corner of 46A and Orange Boulevard. We'd had a guest speaker that night. We had one of our great Dream Team meetings. It was a great time of celebration, and we were watching the basketball game while we were eating a meal that night. And all of a sudden, the players that were playing that game walked off the court. Literally, right in the middle of the game, it stopped, and they walked off the court. And we're like, what just happened? What just happened? You see, there was this little virus, this little virus that would spread around the globe and claim hundreds of thousands of people's lives that created such fear in people that it literally would separate families and homes like I've never seen in my generation. I mean, separated people based on a belief of what they thought about this virus. There was great fear that came. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke's gospel, chapter 21. He said, there will be strange signs in the moon, the sun, and the stars. And, he, and here on earth, the nations will be in turmoil, perplexed by the roaring seas and strange tides. People will be terrified by what they see coming upon the earth. For the powers in heaven will be shaken. Great fear. Have we ever seen fear? Have we ever seen great distress like we've seen? You know, I grew up thinking that UFOs, still kind of think this about UFOs. I don't even know what I believe about UFOs in the moment. But I grew up thinking that anybody that believed in UFOs. <laughs> One of the great conspiracies. In the last two years, we've had Senate subcommittees, congressional hearings, front page of the New York Times, discussions about UFOs. Wow. Never thought I would see that. We're, we have wars and rumors of wars this very moment. You cannot open your news page, whatever you read, whatever you look at for current events. You cannot open it today without the sense of calamity and doom that potentially is going to spread throughout the Middle East. Racial division and strife, the word ethnos, when Jesus said nation against nation, he's literally talking about ethnic group against ethnic group. We see people who are afraid of other people. We see tribalism grow in such a way that we are afraid of what other people think, believe, or look like. Famines and pestilence and earthquakes. Jesus said people will be terrified. 
It was a great day of distress. We sense it already. I mean, I don't know about you, but over the last couple of years, man, there's just been a sense of impending doom that seems to permeate culture and society. Everyone has, I mean, I've heard it from so many people, people in my neighborhood, people that I talk to at the grocery store. Things just don't seem to be right. So there's great fear upon the land. The second thing Jesus said would come, that there would be a spirit of offense. Everyone say spirit of offense. Look at Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, verse number 10. And then many will be offended. Offended. Cancel culture. Right and left. Both sides of the political, cult, uh, the political aisle today. Everyone is, seems to be canceling other people. You can name the topic. And if you believe that, someone's going to want to cancel you. Many will be offended. Fall away. We'll betray one another and we'll hate one another. We had a civil war in America in the 1860s, 1860, 600,000. We're a population of 30 million people. Today, we're a population of 350 million people. Do you know how many people died in the Civil War, primarily here in the South? You know how many people died? 600,000. Percentage-wise, we've never seen anything on this. It was bloody. My wife and I tried to watch the Civil War put out by Ken Burns several years back. I could hardly watch it. It was so disturbing. And the same kinds of rhetoric and language that was used then, we hear being broadcast from our news reports, our newspapers, our, 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 our institutions, our politics, uh, our colleges and universities. Jesus said people will be offended. The only way you can actually pick up a gun to kill someone else is you have to be offended. And people are offended in a way today like I have not seen in my, in my lifetime. The issue that I believe is that we find we have people are finding their identity in everything but Christ. People are finding their identity in politics. People are finding identity in what they believe about uh, about economics. People are finding their identity in their race. People are finding their identity in their gender. People are finding their identity in everything but the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless, not I that live, but it is Christ that lives in me. Hear me today, church. This is not about race. This is not about religion. Come on, this is not about a political ideology. This is about a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and the Lord of lords. Someone said amen today. Listen to what Jesus says here. This is Jesus. I didn't write this. And everybody smile at me. Come on, push the happy button. I didn't write this. This is Jesus. He's our king. He's our Lord. Matthew 24, verse 12. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Because we find our identity in everything but Christ, the mission and the mandate of bringing God's love to our community and lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus goes to the wayside. A love of most will grow cold. How's your love today? What's the priority of your life today? Could you be convicted of being a Christian? Could you be convicted of being a disciple of Jesus? The third, the third area that Jesus spoke of was the area of lust and sexual perversion. Lust and sexual perversion. A disregard for God's law. A complete disregard for God's law and God's word. Do you know that God loves you today? Do you know that God is not a killjoy today? Do you know that God doesn't want to destroy you today? You know the Bible says that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to a knowledge of his son through repentance, through turning their hearts and life to him. But Jesus warned. In Matthew 5, Jesus was really clear about lust and the consequences of lust. But in Luke's gospel, chapter 17, Jesus says, It was the same in the days of Lot. It was the same in the days of Lot. Lot lived in a generation where people practiced perversity just like they do today. Homosexuality was the norm of the day. Homosexuality was the practice that many men were engaged in. You can read the story in the book of Genesis, Genesis for yourself. But Jesus says, "Add as it in the days of Lot, people were eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. 
But on the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. And it will be just like that on the day the Son of Man returns. Just like that. All kinds of sexual sins. It isn't just homosexuality. We have a woke mind virus, I call it in our day today. We believe our politicians, we believe our professors, and we believe our political parties and pundits before we believe the prophets and the promises of God's word. We believe today. So many have rejected the truth of Scripture. But the, God, the Bible, and God's word is very clear. See, many people believe that they can sexually sin without impunity. We can live any kind of life. We can, God is merciful. God is loving. All that is absolutely true. But he's also a God who is holy. Fornication, adultery, pornica- porn- pornography, homosexuality. Every sexual sin that's listed in the Bible is practiced in our day. There's nothing new under the sun. But the Bible says that in the last day there will be an increase of wickedness. You know the challenge is today that everything is right before you instantaneously. Everything, every kind of sin, every kind of temptation just lays before you right in that little thing that you hold in your hand called the cell phone. The last area that Jesus talked about, he talked about the area of great deception. Great deception. In Matthew 24, 4, Jesus says it like this. Jesus answered, watch out. Everyone say, watch out. Let no one deceive you. Verse 24 Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, Jesus said, For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders. Would perform great signs and wonders. Look at the text there. That would deceive even the elect if that were not possible. Jesus said, as it would be in the days of Lot and in the days of Noah. He said false prophets would arise. As a matter of fact, Jesus would refer to, the, to what took place in the book of Daniel, the desolation of, of abomination. Jesus would refer to it, which Paul would also refer to as the rise of the Antichrist in Jerusalem. People would become lovers of self more than God. Great deception, false te- teaching and ideologies. Ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You have access to more knowledge. You name a topic. You go on YouTube and you put that topic in and you can get thousands of videos. You can name any biblical topic. You can name, you can, well, I learned my wife and I, a couple of years ago, our dishwasher was broken. So I got the serial number of the dishwasher and I put the make and the serial number in the YouTube channel and all of a sudden it popped up. The very issue that I had, I could watch a guy fixing the video. Now we tried to fix it. We still had to call someone to come in and fix it for us. But knowledge of every topic, some of those brilliant minds, and knowledge increases, increases because it builds upon one another. We see this. Daniel said that in the last days, people would go to and fro. There would be a great increase of knowledge. There's a great increase of knowledge like we've never seen. And while this knowledge is increasing, we become numb. There's a tendency, tendency, as Nathan said a couple of weeks ago, to catastrophize every single event that takes place, like we're waiting for the new, next shoe to drop. But we also become numb at the information that constantly bombards our minds, our hearts, and our lives. Just bombarded with it constantly. We become numb to the signs. On Friday, uh, the guy that drives the truck, you know, one of those trucks, You've heard that truck roll through your neighborhood, stop, and you think, you know, maybe he's coming to me, it goes to the neighbor, but on Friday, he stopped at our door, and he left a package like this. Anybody ever get a package laying at your front door before? Come on. Come on, right? UPS, FedEx. I mean, all of us have received a package that looks like this. So I walked out the door, and I picked up the package, and I looked straight ahead, and then I saw something like this. Next slide, please. The gate into our little space there, the gate into our little townhouse there was left wide open. Not a problem. It happens almost every single time someone walks out this gate. But the problem, the problem, a couple of years ago, I got tired of going, tired of going out and keep shutting that gate all day long. So I got a bright idea. I'm going to put a sign. <laughs> Please close the gate. It's on both sides. When you walk in, 
It's, it's there. And when you go out, it's there. How was my gate left that day? Wide open. Because no one pays attention to signs. They're meant for everybody else but me. And Jesus said there would be signs. Fear like the world's never seen. Offense like the world's never seen. Lust like the world's never seen. Deception like the world's never seen. And guess what? Que sera, sera, sera. Bless me, Lord. Yeah. We just live in our life. Fighting for the next meal. For the next page. All those things are important. But Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about where you're going to sleep. I mean, even the birds of the air, your father has already made provision for them. Don't worry about that. But what we should worry about is that our own hearts and souls are waiting in anticipation for the coming of our Lord and Savior. You see, there's a lot of negative signs, but there's some awesome, powerful signs. Awesome, powerful, and positive signs. I want you to hear this today. Before Jesus returns... The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a building, but a group of people. They'll be pure and powerful. The Bible says the bride has made herself ready. It was granted for her, the bride of Christ. We are the bride of Christ. It was granted for her to clothe herself with fine linen. Bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. You see, the accuser of our brother goes before us day and night, day and night, accuse us. We're not good enough. We'll never make it. We're going to miss the return of Jesus. The enemy will say all kinds of lying things about you. But I want you to know today when you put your faith and your hope in Jesus and your heart is prepared for his return, I want you to hear what the book of Revelation says about that church. And they, the Lord, the church, the pure church, the powerful church of the Lord Jesus Christ have conquered Satan by the blood of the Lamb by the word of their testimony for they love not their lives even unto death come on someone give them a praise today he's coming back Paul the apostle said the bride of Christ will be pure and holy he'll present to her a pure and holy church the second thing is that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh it is not just for, it's the whole whole covenant. The whole covenant was the story of God's people and their constant backsliding. People who were chosen by him. People who were promised great blessings to be the head and not the tail. People who God said, I will bless you and make you a blessing to the nations. They just couldn't handle the blessings. And their hearts kept turning cold. and They kept living for themselves. And finding themselves in captivity and problems and challenges but God said there's coming a day it's not just for a people it's for all people it's not just for the Jewish race it's for all races Peter has an encounter with the Holy Spirit after Jesus is resurrected from the dead and it would change his life it would, it would purify him in one moment a man who had been characterized by fear, a man who actually denied his very Lord and Savior, who he watched go to the cross, who he lived with and who loved him and who he worked miracles alongside of. Jesus, Jesus knew Peter. And he said, Peter, the enemy, Satan, desires to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed that you would not fail, but that you would st stand strong and strengthen your brothers. This St. Peter he encounters the Holy Spirit and he stands up in front of 3,000 people. A man who goes from a wimp, fearful, running for his life to a man who is being bold and a warrior for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he talks in words that resonate so strongly in his day that in one moment, 3,000 people fall on their knees and repent. Turn their life to Christ. And this is what Peter says. He says, in the last days, in the days before Jesus returns, I will pour out my spirit on all people. 
Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. You see, it would go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, until the ends of the earth. From the east to the west to the north to the south. From the islands of the sea to the continent of Africa. From the continent of Europe and the Middle East all the way to the Far East, to the South and Latin America. Do you know the largest churches in the history of the world weren't in the early church? The largest churches in the history of the world right now. Do you know why? Because these are the last days. Are you ready? Are you awaiting and watching his return? So what today? So what do you do with this? Do you live in gloom and fear? You know what I've found? I've found that if you're not ready to meet Jesus, this could be a very terrible and fearful time. If you're not really convinced that Jesus is going to return for his church, the body of Christ, the things that are taking place, and I have a sneaking suspicion they're going to get worse. They could get a lot worse. They're going to create great fear and dread. Jesus actually used the word terrified, dismayed. People are living in that kind of fear. And it's not going to get better. In the natural, it's not going to get better. But in the spiritual, for the overcomer, for the blood bought, for the child of God. Come on, for the child of God, for the saint in Christ Jesus. Things are going to get better and better and better until the coming day. You know why? Because we're going to get bolder and bolder and more confident that our God reigns and he loves people. And he's commanded us to tell people about his love and his goodness. It's the only hope today. Listen, people are either going to live in gloom and despair or they're going to live in faith and hope. You see, because this is our mission today. This is our mission and our mandate. Matthew chapter 24. Listen to what Jesus says. And the good news. Everyone say good news. Come on. All the bad news in the world. I got some good news for you today. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. It's good news. I got good news about the kingdom. It will be preached throughout all the world. And so that all the nations will hear it. Every tongue, every tribe, all the nations will hear it. And then the end will come. All the nations. We're coming on another holiday season. I just want to challenge us today. Is there a neighbor that you can start praying for that doesn't know Christ, that you can invite to one of our Christmas services? Is there someone in your community, a friend, Maybe a coworker that you work with. They don't know Jesus. They don't really know. They're living in fear. There's about 15% of the people in America that are on the left and 15% are on the right and everybody else is in the middle just ducking for cover. But people on the left are getting louder and people on the right are getting louder and there's great political tension and people need good news today. They need good news. And you have the message of good news. Are you willing to share that good news with a neighbor? Are you willing to share that good news with a family member or friend? Will you join with me as we begin to pray for our communities today? Begin to pray. We're going to open our doors this Christmas. We're going to be talking about Jesus, the Prince of Peace. The theme for Christmas this year is peace. We're praying for peace. We're believing for peace. Peace will ultimately come when Jesus returns. And honestly, that's what we're praying. The last thing that John said in the book of Revelation, the great revelation of the apocalypse, things that are to come, the last thing that John said was, even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It may be morn, it may be noon. No one knows, no one knows, but he's coming soon. Will you close your eyes? going to sing I Speak Jesus in just a moment. You guys can take this here. I want to first challenge you. Maybe you've been living in fear. Man, you got, you got all this stuff happening and so much confusion and people are saying all kinds of things. And today, you're not living in peace. 
Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is not in the center of your life. You know it today. Every head bowed and every eye closed. And today you're here and you say, Pastor, will you pray for me? I need the peace of God in my life. I need Jesus to be in complete control. I give it to him. Today, if that's you, you might already be a believer, but you've just been sucked into this vortex of what's happening in our world. If that's you, when I count to three, just lift your hand. There's no reason to be ashamed today. No one's looking. One, two, three. Come on, across this room right now. All across this room, hands are raised. Come on, all across this room. While you're seated there, I want everyone just to just place your hands in front of you, all of us today. Just place your hands in front of you. In your own words, right where you're seated, with your hands open, representing an open heart, just in your own words, just say, Jesus, fill me with peace today. Forgive me for my unbelief. Forgive me for the fear that's captivated my heart, the offense that's paralyzed my life. The lust that's paralyzed me. The deception that I've allowed into my life. God, forgive me today. Fill me, Lord, now. Help me to to be numbered among those who are overcomers, victorious. Fill me today. Jesus, we simply speak your name. Lord, you saw every hand that was raised. I pray the peace of God that passes all understanding. I come against every assignment, every plot, every plan of Satan's evil schemes that have come to destroy, come to deceive the people of God. Father, every person at the sound of my voice, they're here today because there's something in their heart that wants to serve and love you. And God, I bless them today. I pray that you'll fill them today. I pray that you'll baptize them today. I pray that you'll immerse them in your Holy Spirit. God, as we stand and lift our voice and worship to you, to you today, come, saturate, fill our hearts today in Jesus' powerful and wonderful name. Will you stand with me today? Let's, let's make this our declaration as we speak in the name of Jesus.